there. Welcome to the e-commerce nurse podcast, our third episode. I'm Karina McLeod, ex-Amazonian consultant and founder of e-commerce nurse and vendor society. Today, we're going to be talking about outsourcing and why more and more businesses are hiring freelancers and agencies to manage a number of their tasks. We have a special guest, Connor Gillivan, who is a founder and the chief marketing officer of freeup.com. He started his first e-commerce business in 2009 and scaled it to sell over 25 million online. After years of frustration hiring from other online platforms, he and his business partner started FreeUp in 2015 to make online hiring simpler for e-commerce businesses. So welcome, Connor. Thanks for coming on our show. It's awesome to have you and uh, it is a great topic to be covering today. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to chat. Fantastic. So with remote working in the online and digital world, it's really become a bit of a norm and uh, to a number of businesses compared to years ago when a lot more companies were a bit nervous to outsource with that fear of losing control and not being able to, to peer over their colleagues' shoulders and watch over their mm-hmm. team. But times have changed. It seems that it's more accepted now. Um, But what really has changed that shift in dynamics for outsourcing to be so widely acceptable across businesses these days? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a a lot of factors that that go into this shift that we're going through and that we've seen happening probably for the last 10 to 15 years. Um, If you look at some of the, the larger companies in the industry, your Upwork, Fiverr, people per hour, um, guru, you know, a number of them, they've, they've been on the map for almost 15 years and in operation. Um, so they've been slowly accelerating the comfortability that business owners have with hiring people remotely. If you, if you think before those platforms, there wasn't as easy of ways to find and work with people remotely it was a lot much more of a trust factor or you were going through a larger business process outsourcing agency in a country like India or the Philippines. Um, But that was, I think, more reserved for larger corporations that had large budgets and and were really looking to hire people as teams and in larger quantities. Um, So, you know, that, that one, the one thing is, there's now websites and platforms where anyone, any business owner, any entrepreneur can go, they can create an account and they can look for people or post jobs for freelancers that have specific skill sets that they're looking for to help their business. Um, so I, I think that's one of the, the first big things and all of that kind of comes around just to, there's a large movement going on now as well globally where people, professionals, they're, they're interested in, in work relationships that are outside of the normal nine to five full-time employee situation. Um, maybe they want more time to spend with their family or more freedom to travel or just more time to do things in their personal life that doesn't require the traveling to work every day, sitting in an office, um, and, and kind of going through that regular uh, routine. Um, and they want more of the remote lifestyle where they work with multiple clients, they kind of dictate their own schedule, uh, and, and in effect, they kind of dictate their own income as well. So I would say some of those are, are some of the factors, but um, there's a lot out there that's moving this industry along and, and pushing people towards the, the freelance world. Yeah, and that's, that's an interesting point that you've made in terms of lifestyle, because um, we definitely see that. Um, uh, even among our team, and I think there's a there's sometimes the assumption when you're outsourcing that you might ne- might be outsourcing overseas, but it isn't just that you can outsource. I guess within your own country, it's just more not having someone specifically positioned in your office. Yeah, exactly. I I agree that that word outsourcing definitely has the connotation of somewhere outside of your home country, but. Um, I mean, personally, with, with myself and, and the companies I've run, uh, we do a lot of outsourcing that's within our country as well. It's just someone that may be located on the other side of the, the country in a different time zone still. Um, 
but we're working with them remotely. So it, it still falls into that, that world of outsourcing. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And uh, yeah, as you say, interesting that the dynamics have shifted, but actually it's become uh, easier to do than it was years ago with all the different uh, sites and in including freeup.com that make, make it a lot easier for businesses to be able to hire people or individuals um, to uh, manage certain tasks for them. I guess when, when it comes to outsourcing, some there are people out there that are still nervous and uh, that, they think that there's an element of risk but are not really sure what that is. Um, mm -hmm. when, when a business does outsource, um, what should they really be mindful of and what sort of risks are there that they should be, be taking into consideration? Yeah, great question. Um, I think there's always a risk when you're hiring anyone for your business. Um, when it comes to outsourcing and working with someone remotely, there's, there's kind of three main things I would say um, that, that are risks that you may run into and you'll need to kind of figure out your own solutions for as you're running your business. Um, the, the first would just be the, the work of actually pre-vetting and, and interviewing people that are interested in working with you in a, a remote situation, um, you, you want to treat it as if you're hiring someone full-time in-house, uh, you know, where you would, you know, look at their references, make sure you're going through their past experiences, give them test projects or hypothetical situations so you can understand their actual knowledge of the area that you're looking to hire them in. Um, there's definitely a risk there when business owners don't take that process up front as seriously. It can lead to them hiring someone maybe solely based off of the uh, the dollar amount that they think they could be saving, um, and then it just doesn't work out over time, or they, they just don't look into the person's skills enough, um, and it's not a great fit over the long run. So I would say that's one of the first things is up front, how are you pre-vetting? How are you interviewing? Um, are you making sure that they're actually a right fit for your business, um, or are you just hiring because it's more affordable um, and, and it, it seems like it could be a good fit. Yeah, that's an interesting point when you talk about affordability, because I think sometimes I know when we've spoken to uh, different people and different businesses that outsource, that sometimes it can be a bit fi too fixated on the dollar amount. Oh, well, that person is X amount cheaper, but and going based on price and then sort of, disappointed with the results because they didn't necessarily go through that process. Yeah. And it's, I think it's a mistake most business owners have to make themselves. Uh, I personally did it when, uh, when my business partner and I were running our Amazon business and we first started learning about outsourcing. Um, it, it's exciting and tempting to see that you can hire someone uh, for a lower rate overseas outside of your country and really save that amount on someone you'd be hiring in your own country. Um, but if you just focus on the dollar amount, I can say from experience, it really doesn't work out. You need to look for, you know, the, the price, but also that person's um, experience, that person's attitude um, and, and how they communicate with you and how they've worked with past clients as well. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And in terms of then the vetting, um, you mentioned about tr test projects and stuff. I guess when it comes to, you know, if you're hiring someone and they're coming to the office and you get to see them face to face, sort of vetting them is very different. Like in a face to face interview, you get you get that initial handshake or mm -hmm. you even get to see the body language, which can sometimes tell you quite a bit about about a person. Um, mm -hmm. Are there any best practices that you would uh, recommend when it comes to that vetting sort of interviewing process with freelancers? Yeah, definitely. Um, so if, if you are someone that, that really you know, kind of makes your, your judgment on someone off of that live interaction, I definitely encourage people to use Zoom um, and, and you can do video meetings with people anywhere in the world. Um, and so you'll be able to kind of get that experience of being in person with them um, through, through a video chat. It won't be exactly the same as if you were sitting across the room from them, um, but it, it kind of creates that same experience. So you can, you can actually see them, you can hear them, you can see how they're reacting to questions and what their body language is. 
Um, so I would definitely encourage that. And then my other thing would just be to take it slow as you're getting started with it. So maybe you do one video meeting and if you feel good about it, don't just jump right to hiring. Uh, maybe you have a, a second follow-up one where you're focusing on something different and you're just getting to know them a little bit better. Um, and, and maybe even you do a couple phone calls if, if you prefer that over video. Uh, there's a lot of different ways you can set up your interview process. So it's, it, it is really making them work to, to get that role with you. Um, and it's giving you enough time to learn about them and make sure that you're making a confident decision on who you're hiring. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I like the bit about the, the video um, because actually we've had it where sometimes people aren't necessarily comfortable with video. And then if they're not mm -hmm. comfortable, then, then there's a question of why. So it almost eliminates right. um, some candidates as well. Yeah, definitely. You can, we've used that before too. And like you said, some people just aren't. And I mean, for if that's, that's an easy red flag for you then, if, if that's a big part of how you want to communicate with them going forward and work with them, um, then that's easy. You know, you say, okay, that's, that person's not going to be a fit. Um, and you kind of keep going and, and waiting until you find someone that will jump on a video call with you and you can create that kind of face-to-face -face rapport with. Yeah. And also I like the bit about, you know, it, there's no rush. Often when we're looking to outsource, and I know this comes from, from uh, myself and my team as well, you always, mm -hmm. almost need someone yesterday. And so right. there's this rush to hire someone. Um, but then sometimes if you rush and go too quick, as you've said, you can sometimes make a, an error with your hire or you jump and think, oh, that, that video went, went well, let's, let's mm -hmm. hire them. But I like what you're talk, mentioning as in there's, you could stagger that out as well. Yeah. And, and along with that too, it, it's really important from what we found just doing this for years. Um, it, it's important to go into those initial, whether it's a video call or a phone call or a, a chat online um, when you're doing that interview, it's really important to go in with your ideal candidates makeup or, you know, a list of exactly who you're looking for. Um, and you go through those things up front so that you make sure all the details are covered um, and you're not just, you know, hiring someone based off of a, a good conversation and a, a good feel you had with them. Um, and I mean, that, that could be broken down into, hey, this person's on a different time zone. Would you be able to work this time zone? Um, this is the schedule we're looking for someone to work if it's important that they're on at the same time as you. Um, or we're looking for someone with the availability of 10 to 20 hours per week, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera, all these different little details. It's good to know those up front and, and make sure you go through them. Um, because if you don't, it's something you might forget and then you hire them and you realize a couple weeks into it that you just spent two weeks with them and, and it's not going to work out in the long run. So getting those details up front is, is super important and something I would encourage people to do. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. So no rush, but yeah, also just making sure that they're ticking all the, all the right boxes. And I guess there's an element of not getting carried away with, oh, this feels good. Um, right. So we'll, we'll let all these other parts pass and then finding out that those, those parts were actually key to, mm -hmm. uh, to that work in. And um, so we've spoken a bit, quite a bit about more, I guess, individuals and more freelancers, but then there's mm -hmm. also a number of, um, businesses outsourcing to agencies, large agencies, but also small or what we call boutique agencies. Now, sure. sometimes you get some stories, some, some businesses are a bit, oh, I'm not sure I want to work with an agency anymore. They might have been oversold a service. Um, mm -hmm. And then that, that agency wasn't then able to, to deliver. So are there any tips that businesses can avoid when they're going in and they're being pitched by an agency and it all sounds fantastic and they sign up and then to avoid that certain situation where mm -hmm. they're basically they were way were oversold a service yeah definitely uh, i have a few things and, and this is just again from our experience and what we kind of look out for when working with agencies um for for us we we usually only look to work with those, like you were saying, boutique agencies where we're actually still interacting with the owner of the business and the, the business owner is, they don't necessarily have to be the one performing every part of the, the service they're offering. 
Um, but they're there very much involved in the, the daily operations. Um, and, and they're someone that we can reach out to if we're having questions or having issues and, and want to kind of make some adjustments to the relationship. Um, so that would be, you know, one thing is, is look for those ones where you can actually develop a relationship with the agency owner um, and, and kind of have build that, that rapport with them. Um, another thing would be when you're going through that initial meeting and, and kind of sales process, if you will, um, make sure that your and their expectations are very clear up front. Um, so agencies usually offer all sorts of different services. Um, but just be very clear on what exactly you're looking for and ask them to give you very specific details about, you know, what would be completed, how you'd be communicated with on a regular basis, how you'd be updated on things that are being completed. Um, and then, of course, what the actual costs associated with those are. Um, and then just two other things you could do is I would look for any agency that doesn't have like locked in contracts. I think those are dangerous and those are a lot of the situations where you get promised the, the world up front and then three months down the road into your six month contract, you realize things aren't working out and you're kind of stuck in a situation. And then the last thing would just be, um, and some agencies might not offer this, but before you lock into a, a monthly contract or um, a, a rate for a specific larger project, um, it, it can be smart to, to see if they'd be willing to set up some smaller milestones where, you know, in, in one week they, they work on something and you can kind of see what the relationship looks like and how the communication is and, and make sure it's, it's up to snuff with what you're looking for. Um, and if it's not, you can try to make adjustments or you can say at that point that it's not going to be a great fit and you can try to move on to someone else. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. And I like the bit about a business owner as well. That, that, I guess that's very interesting to see how involved is the, the, the business owner as opposed to just sort of delegating. And of course, their team will be there managing a lot of the, the, the day to day, but having that interaction with someone that you know, if there are any issues and you might not get the response from the, the team, that there is someone that you can call on. Um, yeah as well which i think yeah is definitely something that's uh that's important and also as you mentioned the the milestones i think that that's that's really good advice um is just it's almost like uh, testing and understanding how it all feels but also pushing them um mm -hmm. to work towards targets because i think sometimes with um, what we've seen with agencies is there's this element of complacency that the sort of focus to get get the business on board but without those those targets I mean how do you how do you measure success and without those right. milestones how do you know that the, that it's working out yeah 100% agree and I mean it's tough it when you're hiring for your business and and growing by hiring people or working with agencies it's there's going to be a lot of ups and downs at first you even if you get advice from people and um, you kind of know what you're doing going into it. Um, and I think you can probably agree. You just, you kind of have to learn some lessons yourself as you go through it. Um, and over time you'll, you'll kind of develop your own hiring strategy, outsourcing strategy and, and how you kind of approach everything to avoid some of those common mistakes that you may run into at first. Definitely. And we've often seen it was interesting where, Sometimes um, businesses have almost worked with an agency and the agency dictates to them what, what should be done. And, mm. and I mean, but then further down the line, that isn't what they, they wanted, but they mm. sort of listen to the agency. Is there a point at which it needs to be almost that, yes, the agency knows what they're doing, but at the same time, the business knows what they need as a, from a point of, they have their own internal objectives um, mm -hmm. and they know, know the direction that they want the overall business to go. Yeah, I, I think so. I, I mean, I think sometimes it's, it's, it, it's unique, right? Because sometimes when you're hiring an agency, you are really trying to tap into their knowledge in a specific topic that 
you may not know as much about. So you're more inclined to listen to their suggestions and, and follow their plan of action, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's important that business owners keep their voice in the equation uh, and make sure that any suggestion that the agency is making, at the end of the day, it's fully aligning with the business's main objectives and what they're looking to uh, you know, get done in, in terms of growth with that relationship. Um, it, it's dangerous to take a step back and just let the agency do everything without check-ins or regular strategy calls. Um, you want to stay involved and make sure that you're managing them properly so you're getting out of the relationship what you want um, and they're not just kind of putting you into their own system. Yeah, that's definitely, yeah, definitely a good point. And that sort of leads on to the other question that I wanted to ask was more about there is this fear of being left in the dark when you're working with an agency and also a, a freelancer, mm. uh, an individual as well, because yes, you can't peer over their shoulders and you can't see exactly what they're doing. And um, mm -hmm. so are there any tips there in terms of um, how you can, uh, how businesses can ensure not only is the work produced to a high standard, but mm -hmm. especially when they're working with individuals that charge an hourly rate, that they know that they're getting the, the getting the work for, for the, the accurate, they're being charged for the accurate amount of hours and it's not like they're saying, oh yeah, we can do you X, which would normally take an hour and they're saying, but it would take six hours, especially on a topic that that business yeah. owner probably doesn't know anything about, which is why they're outsourcing it. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, so the first thing that pops in my mind is some sort of um, time tracking or um, screen capture software. Um, and there's a bunch of them out there. Some of the, the platforms offer it, um, but there's also companies like um, Time Doctor and Hubstaff that are specifically used for working with remote hires. Um, and, and what it does is it allows you to have an account as a business owner and then the person you hire to have an account. Um, and they simply log in when they, they start working on anything for you. And, and it it's it doesn't screen capture everything that they're doing, but it takes, I think it's, um, you know, screen captures every few seconds or so that you could go back to and, and reference and, and kind of see that they're actually working on your work during that whole time that they were punched in and, and that they're billing you for. Um, so that's kind of a, a very literal way of having that over the shoulder look at what someone's doing. Um, and then over the long run, I, I think it's a lot about just, the relationship you're able to build with someone too. Um, similar to hiring someone that comes into your office, there's not gonna be as much trust at first, but over time you kind of see what their work ethic is and how they deliver on projects and how they communicate with you. I think a lot of it applies similarly to people that are remote. Um, as a manager, as a business owner, you need to look at it as an opportunity to build that relationship. Um, go through projects with them, get to know them better, understand kind of what their strengths and weaknesses are, what their quirks are, and make sure that you build a level of trust with them so that you're not worrying about them. Oh, oh no, did they overbill me for this project? Or, um, you know, are they actually working on, on my work when they say they are? Um, over the long run, you can find people that are really interested in your business. And at the end of the day, they want to help you, you grow it as much as you want them to, to do that as well. Yeah, definitely. And I think, yeah, it trust is definitely a, a key, a key thing. And as you say, trust, trust comes with time and, um, mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, it's not something that's necessarily earned from day one. And I guess sort of, as you say, the more you start trusting them, the more that you don't necessarily need to look over their shoulder, because of course that takes, that's, that takes the, the point of outsourcing often is because the business owners don't have time yet if they want to spend their time micromanaging it kind of almost defeats the object of, of hiring someone sometimes as well and would you say I mean is there any hostility or not hostility as such but where people are being micromanaged in such a way where the business owner is sort of mm wanting all these screenshots from a motivational point of view. Have you ever seen any uh, times when 
individuals have just sort of felt demotivated or just haven't wanted that sort of level of micromanaging? Yeah, I, I've definitely seen it. Um, it. I would say it occurs um, pretty often as well. And you, you want to be, it, it, I mean, it depends on what type of business owner you are. If that's kind of the way you, you want to build that trust at first, um, you kind of have to do what you have to do. But I think a, a big way that you can make an effort towards it not just seeming like you're trying to watch over their shoulder and, and make sure they're spending all their time as um, high quality as possible is to, you know, like I said, develop that relationship outside of them doing their work on a daily basis, set up weekly meetings um, with them where you talk about strategy a bit more and, and let them know about what the business is doing and how they're contributing and give them goals that they're working towards. Um, and then if you have multiple people that are remote, run weekly meetings where everyone's involved and you're providing updates and kind of giving them motivation on the business and, and where it's headed and, and how they're helping achieve different milestones. I think when you expose someone to, to that higher level vision of the business, at, as opposed to just focusing on the micromanaging of their daily work, it, it gives them more inspiration to, to what they're doing. And then they kind of just see the screenshots or the, the communication on a daily basis that's being required as, as a part of communication that, that's required to, to work with that business owner. Yeah, and I really like that about sort of showing the bigger picture because there's, there's trust comes in, in both, both sides as well. And to really get somebody also to be really invested in the business, they've got to really have passion for that company or feel an element of, of loyalty. Um, and I guess that comes, as you say, when they start feeling inspired or start feeling part of the team because mm -hmm. that business owner is starting to share more the company vision so they can see where they fit in with that as opposed to just being somebody hired solely for output and being monitored solely solely on output as well, that they become become part of a team no matter if they're sort of the other side of the, the world or in another state, but they're still a member of the team. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, and as we, yeah, and I mean, like we were saying earlier too, the whole world is just moving more towards freelance and working remotely with agencies. So the more you adapt your business to, to catering to that, um, you know, it, the, the better you're probably going to be in the long run as more and more people are looking for remote opportunities. Yeah, definitely. Because there's a point of where I think initially outsourcing was just more, okay, I'm going to outsource just this task. And right. this needs to be completed by X time and then job done. But now sort of through this discussion, it's, uh, and I'm sort of thinking about it more and hearing about it more, is there's almost, mm. there's this long term, it's not necessarily outsourcing short term, there's outsourcing long term. And long term means being part of the team. Long term brings in loyalty as yeah. well. And so actually not only are the dynamics, have the dynamics changed for short term, the odd task, but actually people are building global teams, um, remote teams. Yeah, absolutely. 100% agree with you. Cool. Well, thank you ever so much for your time. Uh, there's been some huge tips, uh, a number of tips along the way, which has fan been fantastic. I guess um, before sort of signing off, really, um, mm -hmm. it would be great if we could summarize or if you could summarize what would be those three tips that you would give to someone that's new to outsourcing and working with either freelancers or agencies. Yeah, of course. So th the first one would be kind of as you're starting to think about it uh, and, and kind of visualize how it could be a, a good thing for your business. I, I usually like to look at it in two ways, right? So as a business owner, you're always limited in, in terms of time. So the way to look at outsourcing as, as being a value to you and your business is look at those areas or those tasks within your business that are very repetitive that you're still doing on a daily basis where you should really be spending your time elsewhere trying to grow, trying to strategize. Um, th those those one-off tasks that are just very repetitive on a daily basis are great ones that could be outsourced to someone, um, usually at a more affordable rate than what your hourly rate is, um, and that, that can really help to automate your business a bit more. And then the second one is, if you have something on 
the strategy of your business in terms of growth that you just don't know enough about. And it would take you, let's say three to six months to really dive into and, and learn more about. That's another great area where you can outsource to, like we were saying, someone in your country or someone in a country nearby um, that is, is kind of an expert in that area um, or even an, a, a boutique agency that accelerates in that area that could take that off your plate and allow you to stay focused on what you do best. Um, so those are, you know, those are kind of the two ways to, to think about outsourcing. And then the other two tips would just be what one I said before was, you know, start slow. Don't, don't kill yourself and, and try to hire a ton of people at the same time and, um, you know, struggle to get it all set up. Do one person at a time, run it for a few weeks, do some tests, understand how it impacts your business um, and how you are going to manage it and, and what it does to the time that you need to manage things and then kind of go from there. And then the last thing is just make sure your communication expectations are set very clearly up front so that you don't ever have issues getting in touch with people or getting updates and understanding what people are doing for you remotely. Um, I think the, the most horror stories I've heard from people that try outsourcing is, is, is around communication. So the more you can do to set expectations up front, the better and, and the better off you'll be working with them in the long run as well. Great. That's, that's, those are some, some awesome tips. And in fact, the whole, I found this whole uh, conversation uh, really, really useful and invaluable invalu because us, within just our business, we're, we're hiring, we're outsourcing. And so there's some really useful uh, nuggets of information there and tips on, on the best way to hire. So as I said, thank you so much, Connor, for being an amazing guest today and sharing your years of experience when it comes to outsourcing. And I'm sure our listen, listeners will be very pleased to uh, be able to listen to, to all the information that you shared with us today. Yeah, of course. Thanks so much for having, having me. And you know, if anyone listens and has any questions, I'm, I'm also happy to hop on a call with them or exchange emails. Um, always, always happy to, to help people that are looking to get into outsourcing and, and hiring and, and working with people remotely. Great. And would the best way to contact you be, would be through freeup.com? Yeah, exactly. So if, if you go on freeup.com and it is with three E's, F-R-E-E-E-U-P.com, um, you'll see a, a button at the top that says to schedule a meeting and you can actually set up a, a phone call with myself or my business partner. Um, we, we put our calendars on there as a, a way to, to try to meet people that are interested in, in working with us. So they can do that um, or they can just email me at connor at freeup.com. Great. Thank you ever so much, Connor. Awesome. Thanks so much. Thanks. Bye. Cheers. For our next episode, we are going to be focusing on Amazon France and understanding the French market and how this differs to other European marketplaces when it comes to selling on Amazon.